Hello, everyone. I'm Seku Sidi, President and CEO of the restaurant Opportunity Centers United. I'm truly honored to be with you at this very special moment. And it's just an incredible feeling to be standing right in the middle of a downtown Seattle. A stunning city full of life, history, culture, opportunities, and the most eclectic restaurant imaginable. Today, on behalf of the Restaurant Opportunities Center United and our partners at the City of Seattle Office of Civil Rights, it is my deepest honor to join you in paying tribute to Seattle restaurant owners who continue to prioritize sustainable racial equity during a volatile and challenging year, and who committed to providing living wages and better working conditions for their workers, the majority of whom are immigrant, women, and the people of color. Welcome to the beautiful city of Seattle. I'm Mariko Lockhart, and I'm truly grateful that the Seattle Office for Civil Rights is participating in this momentous celebration, uplifting racial equity efforts in the Seattle restaurant industry. Understanding the effects of COVID-19 on communities of color who often hold low wage positions with fewer protections, we hope to honor the work done to make restaurants more equitable, safe, and profitable for all restaurant staff. Our vision of Seattle is a city of liberated people where communities historically impacted by racism, oppression, and colonization hold power and thrive. That's why we want to show you the important work being done in Seattle's restaurant industry by those who understand the importance of equity and representation. That when you give all people equitable access to thrive, everyone benefits from that work. It's been over a year since the coronavirus pandemic reached the American shore. Since then, more than 44 million Americans have lost their jobs, including nearly 6 million from the restaurant industry alone. As we continue to grapple with the effect of the pandemic, it is the restaurant owners and workers who risk their lives to serve us. They are our sisters and their brothers, parents, friends, neighbors, and loved ones working day in and out to bring food to our table, to make our lives a lot easier and enjoyable during this most difficult time. We're coming together as a community of restaurant workers, owners, families, community partners, and supporters to hear what these practices look like and to provide racial equity resources to assist other businesses who want to embark on this racial justice journey. In the short documentary you're about to see, you will hear from restaurant owners who prioritize their workers with fair hiring practices, safer working conditions, and the living wages. Hi, I'm Chef Christy Brown of Communion Restaurant and Bar and That Brown Girl Cooks. I graduated from Seattle Central in 93. And so I've been cooking since then in all kind of capacities since then. But as of late, we opened the restaurant on 24th and Union um, last year. Whew, time is starting to run together. But last November we started and we've been open since then. Uh, my name is Angelina Tolentino and I go by Gina. Um, this is Bar del Corso. This is our restaurant we've had for 10 years now. And we'll be celebrating our anniversary in July. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I was in restaurants when I was in college, as a lot of people are. Um, and that's kind of where I got my start. But really, I had a full career before I opened a restaurant um, as a graphic designer. And then I met my husband in 2002. Um, he was working at a restaurant. It was just kind of the natural movement for him to start something of his own. So I was kind of in on that. I wanted to create something because that's what I like to do. I love to build things up from the ground. And it was just a kind of a natural 
just worked out real well for us to, to do this. My name is Jordan Brown and I, my last job in the restaurant industry pre-pandemic was here at Vermilion Art Gallery and Wine Bar. Um, I started dishwashing, actually McDonald's is my first food service job period. Um, I started dishwashing, I have served, um, I have basically actually I've done every job except manage um, in the restaurant industry. My name is uh, Gabriela Brownstein. I've been living in Seattle for the last five years. I've been working in the service industry for the same amount of time. I was born and raised in Italy um, in an island called Sardinia. Yeah, I actually worked for a company called Heavy Restaurant Group. I uh, worked at Purple Cafe and Wine Bar downtown Seattle for a little over eight years. And then I managed uh, another one of their sister restaurants, Barrio. Um, but my start in the restaurant industry started there, but my start with cooking started at home as a youth with my father. Um, but working in the restaurant, I worked at the wine bar and started off as a food runner, I bus tables, I was an expo. I mean, I did pretty much everything front of the house and then eventually started serving and knew that the next step to learning that whole customer service aspect would be to manage. So then I managed the Barrio Capitol Hill for a little over a year, maybe not even a year, and then uh, opened up Fats Chicken and Waffles uh, with my business partner, Marcus. My name is Gitanjali Vailor and I own a coffee shop in the Central District here in Seattle. It's called Union Coffee and Wine. So we sell coffee and natural wine, have little snacks, and I have a team of six currently, and we're still kind of doing this thing during the pandemic. <laughs> I kind of came to coffee in an interesting way. After college, I needed to take a break from people, so I went and worked on a farm and from there I learned a little bit more about agriculture and uh, crop to cup, crop to table and realized that I wanted to work in, a, in the food industry at some capacity. I thought more on the agricultural side but um, from that agriculture gig where I was a farmhand I started working at a coffee shop and knew that I could fall in love with the bean to cup um, direct trade um, of coffee. So I was th there in Georgia. That's where I kind of started and I came up to Seattle to continue working in coffee and now I'm here five years later with my shop. I came to Seattle uh, with a really nice resume that I have built up over time. And I found myself being invited to so many job interviews because my name, Jordan Brown, is racially ambiguous. Um, and then I would get there and I would be offered positions in the back when most of my experience is front of house. You can go work at one company, have a ton of experience, and then take that experience somewhere else, and then it's not received. And so if it's not received from a different company, then it would be like, what were the particular reasons why it wasn't received? The restaurant industry's history of, especially when it comes to America, like the hiring of people of color, um, and specifically black people, American descendants of slavery, and the way they were treated, um, it's something that has never been rectified. And if we're looking for solutions for our future, I think that it's something that we need to address. Um, I think there are inherent biases that we all have. Maybe the way that we were taught things in school or just societal. I've had to unpack certain things that I have just because I grew up in such an assimilated white culture. Um, I mean, I'm proud to be a Filipino now, but I remember when I was younger, I was like, Oh, Dad, hide that fish stuff that you're eating. Like, it was embarrassing sometimes. Or, you know, there were things that made me so different when I was in school. So I've had to, like, think about what I have to change, what I've learned, and then, like, how to apply that. Like, if a company isn't biased towards anything, they're going to hire the best candidate that's going to make their company grow. I think it's really important to meet people where they're at um, 
and take into consideration their background, where they're coming from, and you know, potential places that they weren't treated well. And so giving them the space and the capacity to either communicate with me through um, email or phone or in person, whatever is most comfortable for them, and uh, still be able to evaluate if they would be a good fit for the position and give them all of the avenues that, you know, that they could communicate in best. There are other ways to find people and there we need to sort of bring those ways in and, and, and use them, you know. When Damon and I started um, started working together, we talked about what principles we believed in as a business and we tried to find ways to institute them all throughout from hiring through our posts about hiring um, and then on into when they come work for us. So like one of our questions, um, which is kind of a statement and a question in the interview that we do is we talk about our mindfulness practices. And so there's a lot of times when we're here, if you're working, we may invite you in to meditate. We may ask you to take a grounding moment. We may stretch. You know, I have visions of doing yoga classes. Like I. I really care about folks' whole being, and so when I say that, I want to start off like that. So we ask that question, like, is that is that something that you're interested in? Does that offend you? How do what? How do you feel about mindfulness? Do you know anything about it? And you know, and I think that that's really that's the beginning of us letting folks know, like, what we believe in, how we stand, and when we try to do that all the way throughout your employment while you're with us. I just look for a qualified candidate. I want to I want to hire someone that I know has good work ethic, that I know that's going to come to work, that's humble and wants to learn, learn how we do things here. There's a lot of people when you work at different restaurants and then you're like, oh, this is how we're doing it over there. Well, this is how we're doing it here. So if this is how you want to do it, then you might not fit here. But my rule of thumb is like, we're all family. You know, I want it to be a fun environment. I want the whoever's working the, when we first opened, I hired someone who had zero restaurant experience, right? But I wrote one sheet of paper of these rules. You follow these steps, you'll be a great server. If folks are not gonna apply that are super duper qualified, then I gotta up my skills as a leader so that I can, so I can teach more, so I can develop the, the workers that I need. Because somebody need a job, now, can do you have the potential for me to work with you and build you up to where I want you to be? Which, honestly, as people of color in this industry, you're going to need that anyway. Because we've been held back for so long. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of I was the lead, I trained this guy, and they promoted the guy over me. And I'm, all the time the person was white. All the time. So when I came here in the U.S., I noticed from my first gig that uh, works in the kitchen, in the restaurants, were really ethnically and racially separated. Part of it is because we have that racial segregation, too, that it exists. It, we have the statistics that show that that exists. Um, the kind of people that get hired in the front um, are more presentable and more palatable to our social, like the social dynamic and standards we've set. That's definitely very, very present in Georgia. I think that most of the people that work back of house are absolutely black and Latinx folks, and the people that work front of house are often white folks. And um, the way the pay structure and tip structure uh, work at those places too, it's often that front of house all they're doing is running the food from the back to the front and they are, you know, taking in the tips and maybe tipping out the kitchen if, if you know, their, their boss requires them to. That's kind of why I, um, I did work in a place that was like that and I, um, it was a banquet situation though where I did not get tipped out, but I did realize that there were so many people that were working in the kitchen that had never gotten raises that had been there for 20 years and they were still making only a couple of dollars over minimum wage. And it was disheartening because I wasn't sure what their growth could look like, but it's also one of the reasons why I went tipless at my cafe. 
to just, you know, cut that disparity between, you know, oh, if I'm doing these cleaning tasks, am I going to, you know, get less money than if I'm, you know, at the register or if I'm at the bar? And it's like, no, we're all, like, contributing, like, important things to keep this place open and running, so we're all just going to get paid equally. Here, I want to make sure that the tips that we get, the kitchen gets. So we get cash, it's evenly divided. The tips are divided so that the back of the house, based on the people that are working, are making money. We are a shared tip house. Um, we share between the back and the front of the house, and that definitely has raised our cooks. Um, a income level and I that's where because I'm a cook that's always been my focus is to make sure that the chefs got paid enough and so I think that um, it's something to look at and I think that's something we're constantly looking at um, one person that really inspires me um, to do better and look at more ways is chef Melissa Miranda she really is committed to making sure that everybody gets a livable wage and so she's playing with different ideas and techniques and then that has us doing the same thing like how can we figure that out because tips are dicey um, and so then how can you make it into something that's more sustainable for everybody including the business because it's a lot on a business to try to manage all of that and try to make it even for everybody and so it's something again that's the ongoing work that we look forward to doing. I raised all of our prices to 20 to 25 percent and everybody here makes 22 dollars an hour. Um, so I mean I'm trying to do what I think is fair. I took into consideration how much people were tipping before and just kind of matched that with um, with my price increase. It felt scary to do a 25% price increase, but that's what people were tipping, and maybe it was just people being you know, thoughtful during a pandemic, but these, are all, these have always been more appropriate prices for, for products like this, so I, I stand by it. But I would rather work those 56 hours on the floor and pay my baristas $20 an hour than take away, you know, take that down to minimum wage and add another person because I can meet my bottom line that way. That didn't feel right. I think traditionally for me, you know, the, the dish pit, people always like treat the people in the back like they do not matter. And my premise is, is that they matter the most. Right, because you're going to mess around. <laughs> you're going to piss somebody off and you're going to be back there washing dishes. Yeah, I wanted to have that the chefs and the people that I have working for me feel loved and know that we're family. I don't know if it's more than any other industry, but restaurants become a family because you're in the weeds together. You're dealing with all kinds of stuff. Like, it's intense. But, like, when it comes down to, like, we all have each other's back. We work as a team. If somebody, you know, it's not like this is your table and I'm not going to touch it. Like, we're all touching that table. We're all talking to those customers. We're all making their food and drinks and welcoming them. And while we're all here together, we're a family and we want everyone to feel like they're part of that family and cared for. So a lot of people come work for me. Like, the idea of being treated like a human is like, a, a new thing to them like because people have treated them like cattle and it's just it's crazy I learn more every day and it's just like I think that I don't know if it has to do with me being a woman but I definitely feel like I'm more concerned about folks who folks is humanity I want them to be able to feel fully themselves when they're working so that they can put their all into their work you're a change maker you show up to and grind day and night Every person, every story Gently fostered
I, I remember asking like, hey, I'd really not like to work in Ballard. I live in Beacon Hill. I can't close this cafe at 9.30 and take the bus home from Ballard. And I, you know, now that I'm an employer and I, I am capable of trying to schedule to everyone's preferences and needs and safety, it's really not that hard to take that into consideration. I want to give people opportunity like someone gave me an opportunity. So I made it even for everyone to work. And as we started adding up more shifts, um, initially when I opened, it was just dinner. Then we added on brunch. Then we added on breakfast and lunch. So, you know, it took time to build the things that we needed. So I hired and basically gave the hours based on the shifts that I needed covered, you know, and with the staff that I had. So it was, it was pretty easy. Like once we added something new, it's like now you got more hours. You know what I mean? So it just was a, it's just a process. It really ended up like, I never had anyone say to me, oh, um, I don't feel like I'm getting enough hours or, you know, can I get more hours? Um, because it was all created evenly. Like I need to take into consideration that my employees have lives. And if it even came down to, we need to shut the cafe down for half a day because there's no one that is capable of working today. Like we're all out of town or half of us are out of town and someone's sick. Like we're not gonna just keep the cafe going because we have to. Like taking into consideration that we're human beings and that our community knows that we're human beings and being able to be flexible in that way. So I just think that that's, that's a part. That's what you have to be committed to the full. Again, if you're committed to their full humanity, then you care more about what they're doing when they're, you know, when they're not at work and see ways that you can compliment. Because when things are not going right in those other parts of their lives, then you're gonna see that show up at work. So you can't just ignore it all the time. You gotta make sure you put some kind of commitment behind seeing if there's ways to make things better. Most of my employees here are um, femme folks. There, there are some women and some femme folks, and you know when men try to cross a boundary, like I'm like, you can say whatever you want, <laughs> and empowering them to feel that way. We don't owe it to, you know, to put ourselves in a place where we're accommodating them because we work in the service industry. It's like no, no means no, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. You can grow at them. It's fine. <laughs> Personally, I try to advocate to the point where, again, like in my day to day, I try to tell to, pe to the people that I find that are being mistreated to, you know, to find a lawyer to fight for themselves. Because a lot of people not only that I've been in contact with, they were from a different ethnicity, but they were also immigrants. So there's always that gap where, who do we go to, you know, if if we get exposed, we're going to be sent back in, my, in our towns. If you have three kids in this country, you don't want to even try that. The amount of heartbreak and brokenness that I've endured over these last six months with the employees that have come through is ridiculous. I just can't believe people would take advantage of folks like that. Why? What's the purpose? What did you, what, what did you get out of that? And I just don't understand. And so, like, I literally had, I had two people quit, and they were friends. <laughs> they quit on the same day, but they both quit. And part of the reason was was that they didn't know how to handle somebody caring about them, and they didn't know if they could trust them. I think it was in the second or third year where we were able to provide um, health insurance and it's not for everybody but it's for people who are here full time or past 30 hours a week and um, when I met my husband I was pretty unaware of some of the things that happen in restaurants and one of the things I just took for granted is that you get health insurance when you work in a restaurant or any business because that's where I came from. I always had health insurance. And it really shocked me that like an industry such as this where it is there's danger. There's you're in front of fire, you're working with knives, you're you know, the danger is higher than a fresh a desk job. And yet most a lot of people in the industry don't have health insurance. So 
development, professional development. I guess one example, I have someone here that is really into social media management, graphic design, and that's what their passion is. That's what they love to do. And so I try to find ways that I can integrate what their passion is into what we do here and um, create projects that they can do and stay engaged with the space. Even during a pandemic, you know, still trying to think of ways to give people the opportunity to grow in the field that they want to grow in. One of the things that we do, I think, is a, is a powerful practice is, is that I'm really big on knowing what people's purpose is. Purpose is, what is your purpose? You know, you don't want to be a dishwasher forever. You know, what could you possibly imagine of something you want to do more than this? And sometimes, sometimes people are so low, they don't know. And then I feel like that's where I come in and I'm like, hey, you know, there's more. Um, I look at people and I see how hard the industry is on their bodies. And I'm saying, okay, this is cool for now, but what's your long term? Because this can't be it. 50, 60 hours a week, uh, every week since I'm here. So like, it's difficult to think about new ways of, you know, make something work if you're always working. If you go to work, go back home, sleep, repeat now. I think there's definitely a, there's a financial disparity between the people who are at the top and then the people who are working for them. And it, it's, it's just a systemic problem, you know? Um, but I think that we look at other leaders, we look at other businesses who have made changes and see how we can make those same changes and actually benefit from them, you know? It, just because things are a certain way doesn't mean that you have to do it that way, right? We have to make a stand because this, this is, I mean, and, and if we become a safe haven for folks, that's cool as long as you come to prepared to do your work. I can't be the fixer of all things, but, you know, I definitely know that that's my intention is for folks to get treated well. I feel like food and beverage is changing a lot um, as of recent, and it's becoming a profession that people can make a career out of. Um, there are a lot of different options, and I think in the coffee industry, we see people going into competition or people kind of growing from this position, working in a cafe into importing or training or larger companies, and those opportunities need to be open to everyone because oftentimes we see um, you know, a, div a diverse group of people working at a fast food restaurant or um, in places where there's not a lot of like growth or development potentially, you know, some, some fast food places you can definitely grow. But um, having those avenues to grow are important for, for everyone. I definitely think that this industry can use a little, a little um, re-looking at. Um, a lot of people pivoted this year because of COVID and those pivots were not just because of survival of the business, but it was also just like, what do we want as humans in the world right now? For us, it's allowed for both of us to like take some time to do some of the things that we love instead of just dealing with the constant crush. And I think that's true of a lot of our employees. So some people just decided like, this industry is not for me anymore. And that's actually something we're dealing with with staffing, but I think it also just makes you realize like, I mean, that first month, I was like, we have access to food, we have a roof over our head. So let's make some food for the, the people in our community. Like, we didn't do a big old, we didn't do as much as some of the other folks did, but um, those things that we already had and we had health insurance, we have all the things we needed to like live and, and, and thrive and all that stuff. So um, we wanted to give back, but also like see how this can change. I've seen people just quit the industry. Um, so that's, that's something that the industry really should be thinking about and like how to make it more equitable in general. One of the first things I did when I worked here was we took a diversity and equity training class. Uh, we did it last summer and 
it was when we were onboarding uh, the folks that were taking care of our wine pop-up. And I mean, it made a big difference. It was something that we could at least like bake into our value system here and, and say like, this is important. Like we want everyone to feel included and safe in here. And one day we'll be back to where we can be open and have people dining in and get more people hired back and everyone to start making more money again. But until then, knowing what we're working with, I want to make it fair so that people come to work and don't feel overworked and underpaid. No one wants to feel like that. The light of the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd protest to really start to no longer come to really start to try and find solutions to these issues, um, w why we have a lack of understanding for each other, why there is an economic disadvantage between races, why we don't, um, why we have these ideas about where people fit and who they're supposed to be. We have to come to the table as owners and chefs and change, period. Period. I hope tonight I steal you with hope, joy, and inspiration. We can truly work together, learn together, and thrive together in a racially equitable industry and society. We will continue to organize, educate, and fight to amplify the voices of the underserved. Please text the number on your screen to join us in this fight to make the restaurant industry racially equitable. Remember, when we fight together, we win together. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Your example to press on and on